Okay, um, so without further ado then, Anna from uh, Maastricht University, please, your presentation. Shh! Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't bring a presentation, uh, so I'm, I'm just going to exchange a few views about the data producers rights. Um, I would like to start by briefly mentioning the context um, of this right, and the context is the data economy uh, package, and, and this package is grounded on objectives such as to allow for the access and sharing of data, free flow of data, etc. And um, this is important because the problem uh, which was identified by the Commission in the communication and in the staff working document is the limited access to non-personal data. And in this, uh, in this sense, several solutions were given um, or are, are mentioned, and among which there is this data producers' right, and um, it's, it's about this right that I would like to, to, to share some points. And I think I will start with a positive point, which is exactly the context where this right has, um, has been mentioned. And, and the context is that it stems from the need to ensure free flow, a free flow of data, uh, data sharing, data access, etc. I'm just not sure whether this right is the best way to achieve this. And uh, I will refer here to the goal stated by the Commission. And uh, this is a twofold goal. One is to clarify the legal situation. And the other one is to unlock machine-generated data. And this, is, in my view, is important to keep in mind, because what we need to assess is whether this right is the, the right way to achieve this. And um, if, if you think about the, the right to clarify the legal situation, there are other options which are pointed down um, by the Commission itself, actually. Um, and, and there are other options that can achieve this. Uh, for example, in the framework of um, suggesting free, um, suggesting fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, for example. And if you, if you compare this type of solutions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, an exclusive right, uh, which is rather burdensome on the legal order, I have some, some issues with the principle of proportionality and uh, how this could give rise, for example, to legal uncertainty as well. Uh, on the other hand, it's, uh, if, if you read the, the communication and, and this data producer's right to allocate rights to the data producer, uh, so the owner or the long-term user of the device, and um, this initial allocation of rights is not necessarily the, the best allocation um, in, in every type of industry. So, so much for, for clarifying. And the second goal of unlocking machine-generated data, and uh, this comes down, in my view, to fostering data access and data sharing. And here, while in theory a, broad, a, a right with broad limitations, an exclusive right with broad limitations could achieve this, and this has been said by other people um, before me. Again, there are other options on, um, on the table that could, more, could be more effective in doing this. And one of them was, for example, regulating access um, alone. And uh, by the way, this option of regulating access alone would be also be in line with uh, the view shared by some, some right holders, uh, or some stakeholders, sorry, which are very happy uh, with the status quo and who are actually more concerned about access than ownership. And this is, this is referred to by the Commission itself. And um, it, it should also be noted that this new right would add a new um, layer of rights to the legal order, which could in turn uh, compromise other objectives of this data economy package, which would be uh, the, the free movement of data. So this, this from the point of view of, um, of the goal of the right. But I would also like to talk a bit about, if I have time, um, talk a bit about the justification for using an IP type of right for non-personal data. Because IP is not aspirin, it's not the solution to every problem. We need to have a justification, actually, to use IP. 
and going through the classic justifications of, of IP or for um, introducing an IP right, I didn't find a match um, in this case. And if I may quickly uh, share this, uh, this, these justifications and how there isn't a match. So uh, on the one hand, you have a, a theory that says that we should introduce or we should protect works because they are the expression of the personality of its author. Not the case here, we're talking about non-personal data. Um, we have another theory which is based on, on reward. We should reward intellectual labor. Also not the case here. Uh, Non-personal machine-generated data does not fit uh, this construction. There is no intellectual labor involved. And um, we have another theory which, which talks about incentive. And here we can think actually about two types of incentive, which is the incentive to generate data and the incentive to share or the in incentive to disseminate. Um, and when it comes to the first one, there is no underproduction of data, actually quite the contrary. So no, no incentive would be needed here. Uh, so if you think about it, no exclusive rights uh, over data would lead to, to the users of these devices producing more data. So this doesn't make much sense. Um, when, when it comes to the incentive to, to disseminate, um, there are, as I mentioned, other options uh, to do this, but actually also in practice firms are already sharing, sharing data um, and, and trading data. So uh, there, there, there is not really an incentive issue either. And we could also finally think about the swipe generous rights, much like we have for Databases and here the, the, the justification is a bit different. Do we need to protect an investment? This would be the justification. Do we need to promote an investment in the creation of um, of data? Um, and and here I would also argue, no, because I don't think there is an investment worth uh, protecting. So first, it's hard to identify a clear pattern across the several. Industries, and this is uh, also said by, by the Commission, usage rights are dependent on a particular um, industry branch and on a particular service provider. And second, we should also be aware, and this is, uh, this is not very clear, we should also be aware of the differences between B2B and B2C, because obviously uh, someone, a, a consumer who has a fitness tracker, for example, would probably be less interested in, que in questions of ownership of the non-personal data generated by this device as compared with, for example, the owner of, of, um, a smart, of machinery in a smart factory. And also the, the, the level of investment will be different in, in both cases. So I don't think there is an, inv an investment at least that we can uh, talk about across all types of industry. Another point I would like to stress, and I will, I will uh, pass the, the, the word to the other speakers here, would be how this right would fit the current legal framework. And here I, I'm aware that there are lots of, of issues to discuss. Uh, there's a question of personal versus non-personal data. There's, uh, more importantly, uh, the question of how this would fit the, the IP current framework namely how this would work with the current database directive, etc. But I think I'm over time, so I'll, I'll pass it on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next uh, speaker is from the University of Amsterdam, Bernd Hugenholtz. Bernd, over to you. Do we have slides ready? There we go. Okay, thank you uh, again, Julia, for uh, inviting me to this, uh, this event. Um, there's some uh, interesting parallels between the neighboring rights that we discussed in the first panel and the data producers' right that I'm discussing now and that Anna was also talking about. Not only because they both originate, at least the idea, in Germany, uh, but also because they're both inspired by this general uneasiness, this idea that large foreign companies, let's call them Google, um, steal data from European industry, particularly German industry. The news in the first panel, and here it's machine-generated data. There's another parallel, both are really bad ideas. Um, although in defense of the neighboring right, the ancillary right for news publishers, there, 
at least there, there's a real problem to be solved. The plight of the news industry, I think we all agree that there's a problem there. Solving it with a neighboring right is a really bad idea, but there's a, a problem. Here, there's not even a problem. Um, there's no industry illness to cure by the introduction of a data producer's right. Uh, in fact, the cure proposed, or at least suggested in the uh, uh, communication, building a data economy, where this idea first surfaced at the European level, the idea of introducing a data producer's right in machine-generated data, that cure is a deadly poison that might exterminate the entire industry, that emerging data-driven industry about which the communication is all about. Why is it so terrible? Well, I agree with uh, everything Anna already said, and I'll add some arguments. Let's first have a quick look at what that right really is. Again, it does not exist, should never exist, maybe already dead. Uh, but let's make sure it gets buried very deeply underground. Um, it's a, a right in non-personal machine-generated data. It's an exclusive right, fully transferable. We don't know what the exact term would be, probably 10 or 20 years. The right owner would be the person operating the machine that generates the data. So an intellectual property right in machine-generated data. A really bad idea. From various perspectives. Let's look at the existing IP perspective. In copyright, we have this golden rule that data are not protected. Uh, Justice Brandeis in the US Supreme Court long ago already said it wonderfully, data are free as the air for common use, and that's what they should remain. Only in very special situations, when there are creative data collections, you will have a copyright claim. Even under the maligned database right, there is no protection for data as such, for machine-generated data. A database right will arise only in case of structured data collections, and there has to be substantial investment. With machine-generated data, you have raw data that are not in any way uh, structured. So this, this would be a revolutionary idea uh, in the light of existing IP law. Now, that's not a decisive argument. You might say, OK, that's it. so there's a gap we need to protect these data as well. They have no owner. Poor data. Um, so why is it really a bad idea? Because this new right would totally disrupt the existing system of IP. It would create an additional layer of protection on just about everything made with the aid of a digital machine. I'll just give you a quick example. That would include, for instance, a film made with a, a digital video uh, 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 camera, uh, the operator of the camera would get his or her own layer of protection on top of all the other rights already in play, the copyright of the screenwriter, the copyright transfer to the film producer, perhaps the neighboring right of the film producer, an extra layer. This would create unnecessary license thickets. Okay, that's not perhaps a very convincing argument either. A bigger argument, a bigger problem is that we have copyright exceptions and limitations protecting user freedoms. These could be seriously undermined by this new layer of rights in all data. Uh, the European Commission, in, his, in the staff working paper, which is rather extensive on this subject, argues that, well, that might not be so much of a problem because this right would protect only the syntactic level and not the semantic. That sounds very philosophical, um, and it actually is. Um, is that a convincing counter-argument? I don't think so. Look at my paper. We don't have time to discuss that now. Um, another problem is that this right would totally undermine the rationales of the existing IP system. IP, whether you like it or not, but if we like IP, it's because we want to reward and promote some Creati creative or innovative activity, something with merit, something of merit. That's why we have copyright, that's why we have patents, that's why we have even the database, right? There's some merit in investing in a database. Here there's no merit, there's just a machine crunching out data automatically. Uh, there is 
no need here for an incentive. This is what the machine does anyway. Um, what this really means is creating a property right in data that totally calls into question and I think essentially undermines the legitimacy of the entire IP equation. It would also uh, do a lot of other bad things. Uh, I already mentioned it would undermine legal certainty. Uh, there is a serious problem in identifying what would be the object of such a right. Machine data are being produced in real time. The velocity of the uh, data generation might make it impossible to identify the object. Ownership might also be a problem. Who actually operates this machine? That could be many people uh, at the same time. Now come the real arguments uh, in my final minus 30 seconds. Um, the uh, data producers, right, would seriously impede the free flow of information that the rest of this communication really cares about. Creating access, creating, promoting the data-driven industry means maximizing access to data. These are, this is an unnecessary restriction to the free flow of information that is behind this whole idea. So, bad idea, let's not do this. <laughs> Apart from all the other things we shouldn't be doing. Okay, thank <laughs> okay. you. Finally, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I was enjoying that so much, I'd rather let you run over time. Uh, so apologies thank you. there. Uh, finally, we have Valérie Laure Benabout from the University of Aix-Marseille. Okay, thank you so much for our invitation. I had prepared 39 slides because I thought I had 15 minutes to talk, but I only have five. So I'm going to the bones uh, of my presentation. And after all I have heard uh, today also trying to maybe combine several ideas, we have been discussing today to access to content. Text and data mining is also a question of access to content. And first, it's access to content, notwithstanding the uh, protection of copyright. Meaning that people, if we consider that text and data mining shall be promoted in some extent because it has a, a social value, then it is my belief that uh, the fact that the item is copyright protected or protected by neighbor, neighboring right, either a press publisher right or, um, or um, sui generis right, is not relevant. Uh, the people who are text and data mining should access to the content, notwithstanding the type of protection on the item. And why is it so important to stress on this question is that uh, I might recall a decision of the Court of Justice of 2015, Ryanair case. In the Ryanair case, there was this question of the protection, uh, well, of the access to a database that was not protected by copyright or sui generis right. And the court said, well, in this case, because it is not under the regime of IP, then there is no right to access and contractual limitation or technical limitation to the access of the database is valuable. It can be opposed to uh, the pretension, the claim to access. Whereas it, if the database had been protected, copyright protected or sui generis protected, then there, was, there would have been th this access through the directive. So my first uh, point is to say, if we consider that uh, we shall scan and analyze this digital content, uh, there's no impediment other than other legitimate interests that, shall be, that, that ch should challenge this access. No contractual limitation, no technical protection measure. Even if the one who uh, draws the lines is not the copyright holder. It's only the content providers. So if we have in mind to have an exception or regime that shall be mandatory for TDM, then it shall not maybe only be addressed within a copyright directive because it's not only a question of copyright. It's only a question. It's also a question of 
access to content, more generally speaking. Um, and this is, uh, the question is, in, in the present proposal, there is this question of lawful access to content. But what is a lawful access to the content? Is it that you have paid to get access to the content? Or is it that you fulfill uh, the contractual provision? Or is it that it's complying with the uh, copyright protection? It's the agony. Egg and in dilemma. So, uh, first of all, we shall think about the access to content. The second question is shall we force copyright holders or right holders or content providers to provide proper content, proper content to be text and data mined? Because the, the other problem is to get proper, meaning proper file interoperability reliability of the data. This is another requirement than the copyright protection. This is investment in the presentation of the data. So uh, shall we think of uh, forcing or enhancing or promoting or encouraging people to invest in this presentation of the data in order to get access to the data? And if yes, does it mean that the, those people should be paid, compensated for their effort, or paid royalties for licensing. How many minutes? Last 30 seconds. Last 30 seconds. OK, so if, if there is a requirement according to copyright protection, then my belief, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very big point, but uh, uh, I don't know how to do it so quickly, that Copyright, so far, in the history of copyright, copyright has been protected because uh, there is an act of communication to the public of a work. Communicate a work to a public means that the human being can perceive the work, okay? So if there's no communication of the work to the people, is it a question of copyright? If it's only a reproduction, technical production, and we have this Article 5.1 exception within the InfoSoc Directive that shows that we feel very ill at ease with this kind of reproduction that are not, uh, um, are not targeted to human being, those ones are exempted from reproduction right. Isn't that the same for text and data mining? Most of the operation of the text and data mining go beyond this requirement of communication to the public of the work, because no work is being communicated. I can elaborate further on this. And this is also good for linking. Human perception of the work shall be the requirement for copyright protection. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I, I know we're all flagging a little bit, it's getting late, but uh, last burst of energy for everyone for the last sort of 15 minutes of conversation, and so I will turn over then to our representative from the European Commission to give you a reaction to these uh, pre presentations. Um, yes, I, well, I, I thought I would be speaking about the data producers' right, uh, but also about uh, the works uh, on the the current work on the database directive, the evaluation, and, the, uh, and say also a few words about text and data mining. But what I'm going to do is that I will reply in particular on data producers, right? Say a few words about the database directive, and then I will shut up forever. <laughs> um, on uh, the, so the first thing is that Bernd, uh, I'm sorry, you got it wrong, or you didn't read it carefully the communications uh, uh, towards uh, a, a thriving uh, uh, data economy, because we have to start from the problem statement. So before saying it's all wrong, so what is the problem that we are trying to fix? The problem is the access to unstructured machine-generated raw data, which have nothing to do, to the best of, of my understanding, uh, with copyright. So what is the situation? The situation now is that you have a number of machines which embed sensors. These sensors generate a stream of live data, machine-generated data, raw data, which are, so who 
who is the owner of the data. So the owner of the data, he will not find an answer in the law. And uh, de facto, so there is a situation of uncertainty as who owns the data, and which is a, a, an issue, you may say, well, but there is not a problem. But the problem stems from the fact that you have the manufacturers of the machine who take advantage of this uncertainty and they assert their ownership, so a, an ownership-like title on the data, say so we own the data, basically. And they are reluctant to give access to these raw data. So the analytics, and it is a fact of life, so there is a problem, it's not true that there is no problem. The analytics take, takes place in-house. The, the manufacturers of the machines and the sensors are reluctant to give access to the data, in particular to, machine, to raw data. So if they give access to the data, they, they structured, so process data, and process data prevents analytics, so prevents innovation. So how do we, so there is the, there is the problem, there is the problem, and uh, uh, how do we find, how do we solve the problem? So one possibility is to regulating access uh, to, to, to data, but then you have to, 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 to identify the holders of the data, so there is one possibility. And regulating access under, under which conditions, uh, which is complicated and, and very problematic. Another issue which is equally complicated and very problematic is to grant the, a right to exploit the data and license the exploitation of the data to the person or the entity which has the greatest, if, if you want, incentive to do so. So certainly not the manufacturer, but the user of the machine. So the user of the machine could be a farm, for example, now in precision farming, you have uh, uh, sensors which are installed in, in various parts of the, of, of the farm and which produce live stream of data. Well, in this case, the farm may say, I have, I have bought the sensors, I am the owner of the data generated by my own sensors. It is not the manufacturers of the sensor. Or, for example, a, a taxi company or a logistics company which has a fleet of cars. So the, the taxi company may say, I am the, the owner of the, uh, of the data generated by my sensors, and I have the right to license the exploitation of the data, for example, in a data market. So you have these, these, these uh, platforms, which are called data markets, which are emerging in, uh, for in, in, the, in the Nordic countries and in the Baltic countries. Um, so th that is the, the issue. Both, both uh, options are are problematic, both options are, are very controversial, but both options, in my opinion, have their, their merits. Um, uh, something, something, now, let me say a few words about the database directive, uh, because the database directive is also about access to the, uh, to the data. So the database directive is, is an old directive, so it dates back to uh, 1996, and at that time, uh, it was considered to create a legal framework uh, that would help uh, the, data, so the database industry to develop. So the, the directive created uh, uh, the sui generis, sui generis right, um, which protects databases uh, uh, for which a substantial investment has been made in the obtaining verification or presentation of the contents. So the sui generis rights, uh, allow the right holders to authorize or prohibit certain acts, uh, or such as, for example, substantial extraction, or the reuse of the content of the database. Now, something which is important is that the database, uh, in all these years, uh, has been evaluated only once. So it's been evaluated once. And uh, what emerged from the, the evaluation is that uh, the eugenesis rights is widely Use. So you have the publishing companies, the news agencies, and telcos, which are using desugenesis rights. And desugenesis rights is seen as a bit, um, how can I say, as, um, as preventing a little bit innovation. So um, um, the, the, the exceptions, uh, such as, for example, the exceptions, exceptions in the field of scientific research uh, are not good enough. Um, uh, 
So given the fact that the directive was adopted a long time ago, we are now in the process of studying the impact of the directive and collecting evidence or empirical evidence on how useful the sui generis right has been in practice and whether the sui generis rights need to be so need to remain in place uh, or the scope of application of this regenerative rise has to, to shrink up. So what we've done is that we, we launched the evaluation process. Uh, we'll, uh, we launch a public consultation in May uh, of this year. We just closed it. And we will start uh, the analysis of the, of the answers, which we hope will be published uh, uh, next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Bernd, I'm going to let you react to uh, some of the comments. Uh, just quickly, uh, uh, a, a reply to uh, Giuseppe Abamonte. Um, of course, uh, I have not, in, my, in, the, in the five minutes that I had, uh, had the opportunity to discuss the entire communication, which actually has a lot of good things in it, and uh, I, actually most of it. The communication, uh, I'm not sure you have uh, all read that. Uh, IP people might have overlooked it. It's actually a, a very interesting uh, piece of work. Uh, uh, discusses issues like sharing data, open data, getting access to data, and all the like. And all, uh, a lot of that I liked a lot. Now, I wasn't asked to talk about that. Uh, I was asked to talk about the, the one thing that I didn't like, and that's the, uh, the data producers, right, which I think is really a terrible mistake. And it's also not necessary. We're well, listening to Giuseppe. We probably agree that it's a bad idea, uh, but it's somehow the idea has, uh, has, uh, has, has arisen that we need, or that s someone has told someone that, they, that we need a, a property right to guarantee access to the data. I don't see that at all. I think under competition law, it's, it's, it's totally normal to regulate access to resources without necessarily having a property right in the resource. So I don't understand that argument, and I think it's wrong, actually. Um, the other argument that I heard is, well, you might actually promote licensing by creating a property right. Well, there might be a little bit of merit in that. Uh, that's basically an incentive-based kind of argument that we, we see in, 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 in IP in general. But uh, the starting point of introducing a new IP right is, is, is further, further away from that. And I think others might want to comment on that. We've, we need to see a market failure. We don't. There's no proof at all of that. There have been some economists writing about it. None have, even the European Commission's own advisors have not seen a market failure that would justify any such intervention. Okay, you want a clarification on this, Giuseppe? No, I, I simply want it. It's not true that there is no market failure. We held a workshop so I was the director for, for data, for big data. There was the European Forum. Uh, I participated in all the meetings of the European Data Forum. And the main issue which was raised by the scientists is that how do we get access to the data? So it's not true, because it, the, 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 this was the, the, the litany of their argument. The recurring argument was, how do we get access to the data? So there is the, issue, the first issue is that th then the question is that, how do we unlock the raw data, so how do I make sure that the manufacturer of the machine agrees to give access to the live stream of data, not data which have, have been processed by the manufacturer, not to the databases of the manufacturer, but to the live stream of data. So for example, how do I make sure that the sensors which are installed on uh, a railway company in which contain and generate uh, information on uh, so live train information is shared with the ticketing company. An answer might be to promote a regime for public domain, positive recognition of a non-exclusive impossibility to make an exclusive protection on things that are not protected by IP rights. Raw materials shall be accessed to even if there is a contractual provision, then 
there's a mandatory access to domain public, public domain. That, that might be an answer, another answer. Not, it's not because there is a value that there should be a, a ownership. Transfer can be organized through contract and access to through a mandatory provision. Thank you. I have a, a comment and a question uh, for you, actually. And uh, my comment is that, indeed, there is, uh, in the communication, uh, the, the limited access to the data as, as a problem. But there are also economic studies that say that, actually, the, the problem is an insufficient demand for data, not the, the access. Um, but, but my question lies uh, on, uh, in another problem, which is you talked about the database directive and the review of the database directive. Um, and I would like to, to hear your opinion on how a potential data producer's right, which is a right if you think about it, and if you put the, 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 the data producer's right and the so generous right close together, the data producer's right would cover this gap left uh, by the database directive, which is at, at the stage of creating data. Um, and given all the, the, the problems that there were with the database directive and even all the, the case law of the court about competition concerns and how we are monopolizing information, would that not be in, in, uh, in conflict, this data producer's right with uh, the, the concerns raised by the database directive? Okay, don't answer that just yet because I'm going to take one round of questions because, as you can see, we're two minutes from finishing. So, Julia and then... This gentleman here, and anyone else, because it's your last chance. Thank okay. you. First of all, uh, I would very much like to welcome uh, this suggestion from Professor Benabou about a positive recognition of the public domain in the law. This is actually something that is uh, asked for by the European Parliament in the Reda report. It doesn't go as far as saying there should be a mandatory access to that public domain, but just recognizing that public domain exists and is valuable, I think, would be a very uh, important step forward. I would like to ask one question to uh, Mr. Abamonte and one more general one. Uh, first of all, uh, we understand uh, there are different opinions on the data producers, right? But of course, what we really want to know is what is the Commission going to do? Uh, the European Parliament said in uh, the Butikofa report that there are problems with the data producers, right? And perhaps the standard contract terms and uh, access to application programming interfaces will be a better way forward. Can you give us any indications of what is going to happen. And uh, I want to encourage you uh, to at least comment a little bit on the text and data mining subject and perhaps also the other speakers. If I understood uh, the intervention correctly, it's the question, is text and data mining copyright relevant in the first place? And so the question I want to ask, if we introduce this exception and it's very narrow. I understand the reason why it's narrow is because you want to make a balanced approach and make everybody happy. But if it's too narrow, could this actually mean that in the end, less things are legal than what is legal today? Okay, and then another question here. So excited to be asking the question, sorry. Um, I'm Max from Incopro, it's a brand protection firm. And I have more of a philosophical question. When we think about allocating IP rights, you kind of quickly went through the fact that you know, um, they're allocated because we need a reward, so machines don't need a reward, so there is no need for the rights. Incentive, machines don't need an incentive, so there is no need for the rights. I don't think we have reverse engineered every human and their intentions for creating things, because I would put forward an argument that a person can create a work which, in which copyright can subsist just because without a desire for an incentive, without a desire for a reward, and then that has been sort of proven in history with some of those inventions and people of a special sort of intellect. So that's, I would just like to hear your opinions on that. And the second sort of suggestion or question or dream would be, do you think there would be a time when we would allocate IP rights to a machine in its own right and as a legal construct similar to a company or a ship? Thank you. OK, those are good questions to finish on. Um, you know, will we award IP rights to a machine or indeed a monkey that uses a photograph or a camera, for example? Um, and then Julia's question. Um, is text and data mining copyright relevant? They're really big, broad questions. So I'm going to go start at this end and get each of your responses before we wrap up. So go. Okay, uh, thank you. I will address that uh, those last uh, questions. And uh, regarding IP rights to machine, my, my question uh, is a resounding no. Uh, and we can, we can talk about that uh, later, but all the construction is, is towards the fact that you have 
you need the, uh, a human being uh, behind it. That's the very construction of authorship, which is part of, of the conditions for protection, if you think about it, because originality in the sense of the author's own intellectual creation, you need an author in this construction. Um, Regarding your, your um, question on justification, it's true that uh, many authors uh, act independently of reward, independently of uh, incentive, um, but that doesn't, doesn't take value of the fact that we need justification to introduce uh, a right, independently of uh, whether an, uh, anecdot an anecdotally uh, there will be uh, someone who doesn't need a reward or an incentive, but you still need these justifications in terms of regulating the legal order. Mining. Is text and data mining copyright relevant? I would Yes, but. Uh, Yes. On, I like your microphone. Um, on the, on the, um, so the data producers right uh, on the public domain, uh, well, the, the difference and one of the, of, of the beauties, uh, so, first of all, you can't say that it is a mistake because it, it has not been made, so it's an idea is an option for, on which we are consulting, and it is it is an option also which is uh, uh, endorsed in uh, in certain academic circles. So it's not an outlandish uh, I idea. Um, uh, so it's an idea which has also some uh, legal merits. The the, um, uh, the idea can be very uh, also consumer friendly. Because for the first time, the consumer may be empowered and may, may play a role. So for example, I would be the owner of the, of the data generated by my car and not Volkswagen, for example. And I, would, I may be empowered for, a, for the first time and play a role in the data economy. So for example, in households may transfer, decide to transfer against consideration all the data into a data sharing market with the help of a data broker. So once again, I don't think that the, the idea is so, so, so crazy and would and, uh, reduce, so this is what the, the, the friends or the data producers right, say, will reduce also the market power of the manufacturers of the machines. Uh, on the other hand, a number of people, uh, in particular those who uh, stand with the manufacturers, say that this may, um, may undermine the incentive of the manufacturers uh, in uh, investing uh, in uh, that data uh, gathering and data collecting uh, technologies. And, and so basically may have, may backfire and may, may have some very negative effects on the data economy. Um, on uh, the um, text and data mining, uh, uh, well, um, uh, Mr. Reda, you are, you are familiar with, with the, 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 the proposal of the commission. So we have proposed an exception, uh, which again, in my opinion, is relevant, has a copyright relevance, uh, um, for which only research organization would be, would be authorized to carry out uh, uh, text and data mining on content which they have lawful access. So basically, I have a subscription to a, to a publication, a scientific publication, I can do as, as a, a research institute in text and data mining. So the, the, uh, the policy objective uh, would be to facilitate, so is to facilitate scientific research, even if moti motivated by commercial purposes. So even if the research is carried out uh, within a PPP, the type of research would benefit from the exception. Um, so it was decided to target uh, specifically text and data mining carried out by research organizations, uh, uh, such as universities and research institutes. Uh, we believe there is a well-functioning licensing market uh, for private companies, so there is no need to extend the scope, the scope of application. Um, now, the, in the discussions, uh, the, so the, the discussions revolve around the extension of the scope of application, for example, to cultural heritage uh, uh, institutions or to any person having lawful access uh, to the content uh, of, the, of the database, such as, for example, individual researchers, uh, startup, and, and private companies. And we are following this very, very closely, as you know very well. Okay. 
it is a question of copyright, among other, other things, because we have this broad definition of the reproduction right within the Article 2 of the InfoSoc Directive. So any kind of reproduction, digitization of material shall uh, bear the authorization of the right holders, whereas we have the 5.1 already exception that, to my mind, cover most of the operation made through data mining. Some of the problems are um, uh, that the researchers want to display the source of their uh, material, and then they have to communicate the source to the public. So here is there is a, a relevant act of communication to the public of the work. Um, this is an issue that shall be dealt with uh, under maybe under copyright consideration, but also under open data policy. Uh, we have done that in France, more or less achieved, but we have tried to say that the, the, those files are research data set, and as such, they can they, they are subject to open data regime. So, this is this is a, a, a global thing that we have to think of, which is um, I, I'm not saying that. <laughs> There is a legitimate sea of text and data mining, and this, this is a question of policy. It's not me to, to decide whether it's only for researcher or for innovation or for startup, whatever. But once we have decided that we shall encourage or authorize text and data mining according to those uh, social value that may uh, be um, fulfilled by the, 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 the processing of the data, then there is a regime, and that shall not be, be uh, only exception. Might be also licensing in certain circumstances if it's if the purpose, if the intent is commercial, and the results of the treatment are only um, commercial, and there's no legitimacy other than commercial treatment or uh, processing of the data. Maybe well. There's no exception, ground for exception there. So I'm not saying that we shall consider it's not a copyright issue at all. I'm just saying that to a certain extent, we shall not consider that any kind of reproduction of the items are copyrighted, protected. And uh, it's only the question of subsequent acts to the digitization or uh, that are not amounting to transient copy that may be uh, uh, subject to a specific regime. And the articulation, the pending articulation between the future exception and the 5.1 exception seems to me rather unclear for the moment it shall be dealt with. That's, well, that's my point. <laughs> and finally then, last but not least. Uh, in answer to uh, Julia's question, is text and data mining under existing law copyright infringement. If the question was put before me, if I were the court, I would say no. Uh, but that uh, is not the decisive answer, obviously. The problem we have with the reproduction right is that it has been defined in such a technical way that uh, uh, from that technical uh, perspective, uh, there is a reproduction and therefore there is an infringement. So I wouldn't bet my money on other courts saying, yes, it is. Um, so we might need either an exception or better, a better interpretation and a better scope definition of the reproduction right. That is actually the right way forward. Because I agree very much with the, the imp imp implied uh, 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 conclusion of your question. Yes, if we start creating N uh, rather narrow exceptions to facilitate some forms of text and data mining only for non-commercial research purposes, only if no licenses are available or whatever. Uh, if we narrow this down, then we are in fact shooting ourselves in the foot and we are creating not the freedom that we want. What would be much better is to have a more normative interpretation of the reproduction right that takes into account the rationale of copyright, which is protecting Copyright works, as Valérie Benabou just said, against the use or the communication, unauthorized communication of a work as a work. And there are actually, there's some interesting scholarship about this. I was just at a conference that was 
about that, but we don't have time to discuss that. Uh, in answer to your provocative question, it's not that provocative. This question has been asked since the 1960s already. <laughs> Is there, will there one day be copyright protection for machines? I think the correct answer is, and I think that's in line with what Anna said, of course. But first, we'll have to make these machines legal persons. Uh, after then, we, we will be able to protect them under copyright. But of course, until then, is a long way uh, ahead. Uh, under, under current interpretations, of course not, because machines do not qualify as right holders. And fortunately, they don't. So, no worries. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as always with a copyright event, I think we're left with more questions than answers. Um, but I'm sure you all knew that coming here. So thank you all for your patience and attention. And if you were following online or if you didn't manage to pick up one of these, you can pick this up. This is full essays by all of our speakers outlining in a bit more detail their points. Um, so... I haven't had a chance to read it all, so please, all of you, do pick it up and read it. And you can download it from the website. Thank you, finally, to our panellists, and thank you again, Julia, for organising.